Recently, I called into Dr. Michael Brown's radio show to ask him a question. This was on the November 21st broadcast. So the question would be, uh, since we don't see Mormonism before, like, the 19th century or is long before, like, something like the 6th century, you know, those, those were created later, right? So we don't see yep. them written before then. So I'm yep. just wondering, when do you think the Catholic Church was created, or when we start to see the Catholic heresy, so to speak, uh, start taking over the Church? Uh, I would say that a key person who helped really develop some of these things is Augustine. So, <laughs> excuse me, at this point, you're in the 4th century. You know, there, there might be things you find, little snippets of them early on in the 2nd and 3rd century, but nothing that would really divide us. I would, <coughs> excuse me, I would say some of the developments begin in the 4th century, but then others much, much, much later. So, so. so listen to that. Catholic development started with St. Augustine, who converted to Christianity in 387 AD, with most of his writings be, uh, coming from the early 5th century. So this is when most of the Catholic heresy started coming into the Church, with much of it coming much, much, much later. Before then, there are little snippets, but nothing that would divide us. That's, that's pretty interesting. And a few weeks later, Dr. Brown was interviewing James White, and they were discussing any theories that the Bible got changed after the original writers. Dr. Brown had this to say. And there is the question. Uh, since these writings were largely circulated, since they give, give birth to a movement, it's not like things happened and then disappeared. You had disciples of the disciples. You had opponents of the disciples. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement, the idea that everything got changed by certain groups. Somebody somewhere along the line is going to protest. Yep. You know, be, because let's just say that Paul changed everything that the original disciples believed and taught. Well, they were around. Some of them lived well after the death of Paul. Yep. And they had their followers and they had their group. So how does this happen? It's basically like someone completely rewrote the American Constitution and substituted it with the Communist Manifesto, and people didn't quite notice. Interesting. So we should expect protest movements whenever someone comes along and changes everything. So then if the original church was a proto-Protestant church and Augustine started making Catholic changes then where were all the protest movements fighting against Augustine and affirming proto-Protestantism? Yet, yeah, where are these people? Where are the proto-Protestants fighting against these Catholic innovations by Augustine? And remember those little snippets that may have existed in the first and second century? The, the ones that wouldn't divide us. Uh, let's take a look at some of those. Ignatius of Antioch's letter to the Smyrnaeans, 108 AD. St. Ignatius was a student of the Apostle John. Okay. See that you all follow the bishop, even as Jesus Christ does the Father, and the presbytery as he would the apostles, and reverence the deacons as being the institution of God. Let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop. Let that be deemed a proper Eucharist, which is administered either by the bishop or by one who, to whom he has entrusted it. Wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people be, even as, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. That's, that's weird. you got bishops, priests, deacons being the institution of God, can't do anything without a bishop, and wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church, all in 108 AD. Just wondering, where were the, uh, the early Protestants saying, Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The well, I mean, hey, maybe, maybe Catholic Church didn't mean what it means now. Maybe it's, you know, um, it just means universal. But, you know, even though it's called the institution of God, even though it's not really an institution, but, you know, maybe institution meant something differently back then. Or, or you know, bishop. Bishop, priests, and deacons. I mean, maybe priests meant something different back then. Or maybe, maybe any Protestant pastor can just call himself a bishop. And it still fits. You know, this doesn't imply apostolic succession or anything, right? Okay, well, well let's see uh, what Irenaeus wrote in Against Heresies, chapter 3, in 189 AD. But since it would be too long to enumerate in such a volume as this the succession of all the churches, we shall confound all those who, in whatever manner, whether through self-satisfaction or vainglory, or through blindness and wicked opinion, 
assemble other than where it is proper by pointing out here the succession of the bishops of the greatest and most ancient church known to all founded and organized at rome by the two most glorious apostles peter and paul that church which has the tradition in the faith which comes down to us after having been announced to men by the apostles with that church because of its superior origin all the churches must agree that is all the faithful in the whole world and it is in her that the faithful everywhere have maintained the apostolic tradition against heresies chapter 3 189 AD surely someone would say you changed it surely you'd have some type of protest movement the huh uh, how about uh Cyprian of Carthage uh, he wrote this in 251 AD and by the way Carthage is a modern-day Tunisia Africa so this guy isn't even Roman so let's listen to what he has to say here the Lord says to Peter I say to you, he says, that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. And to you I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever things you bind on earth shall be also be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven. On Peter he builds the church, and to him he gives the command to feed the sheep. John 21:17. And although he assigns a like power to all the apostles, yet he founded a single cathedra, a single chair. And he established by his own authority a source and an intrinsic reason for that unity. Indeed, the others were also what Peter was. But a primacy is given to Peter, whereby it is made clear that there is but one church and one chair, cathedra. So too, all are shepherds, and the flock is shown to be one, fed by all the apostles in a single-minded accord. If someone does not hold fast to this unity of Peter, can he imagine that he still holds the faith? If he should desert the chair of Peter upon whom the church was built, can he still be confident that he is in the church? In the Unity of the Catholic Church, Chapter 4, A.D. 251, 130, 40 years before Augustine converted. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Weird. It's just, in 251, we're finding apostolic succession and the primacy of the Bishop of Rome. Where are all the proto-Protestants coming in and fighting against this? I just, I don't know. All right, so how about uh, Irenaeus against heresies, again in 189 AD. If the Lord were from other than the Father, how could he rightly take bread which is of the same creation as our own, and confess it to be his body and affirm that the mixture in the cup is his blood. He has declared the cup, a part of creation, to be his own blood, from which he causes our blood to flow, and the bread, a part of creation, he has established as his own body, from which he gives increase unto our bodies. When, therefore, the, the mixed cup and the baked bread receives the logos, the word of God, the actual Greek says Logos, and becomes the Eucharist, the body of Christ. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Justin Martyr, 151 AD, in his first apology, chapter 66. We call this food a Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true and who has been washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration now uh, by the way a little hint towards baptism there anyways and is baptism regeneration and is therefore living as christ enjoined for not as common bread nor common drink do we receive these but since Jesus Christ our Savior was made incarnate by the word of God and had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so too, as we have been taught, the food which has been made into the Eucharist by the Eucharistic prayer set down by him and by the change of which our blood and flesh is nurtured is both the flesh and the blood of that incarnated Jesus. That's in 151 A.D. Then he goes on in a letter to the Smyrnaeans. He's uh, 
refuting the Gnostics. He's talking about the Gnostics here. You can read chapter 4 and 5 for yourself and see that he's talking about the Gnostics. Okay, so take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are in, to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer, because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, flesh which they suffered for our sins, and which that Father, in his goodness, raised up again. They who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. They abstain from the Eucharist, the Gnostics, and from prayer, because they do not confess that the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The okay, fine, fine. Maybe the, the Gnostics got it right. They were the real original proto-Protestants. But, you know, Eucharistic sacrifice, I mean, that didn't come until like the 11th century, right? All right, well, well here's a great one by Justin Martyr. Debating a Jew named Trifo, talking about the Eucharist specifically as a sacrifice. Uh, God has therefore announced in advance that all the sacrifices offered in his name, which Jesus Christ offered, that is, in the Eucharist of the bread and of the chalice, which are offered by us Christians in every part of the world, are pleasing to him. He continues Dialogue with Trifo, chapter 117, written between 130 and 160 AD. Moreover, as I said before, Concerning the sacrifices which you at the time offered, God speaks through Malachi, one of the twelve, as follows. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord, and I will not accept your sacrifices from your hands. For from the rising of the sun until its setting, my name has been glorified among the Gentiles, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a clean offering. For great is my name among the Gentiles, says the Lord, but you profane it. It is of the sacrifices offered to him in every place by us, the Gentiles, that is, the bread of the Eucharist and likewise the cup of the Eucharist, that he speaks at that time, and he says that we glorify his name while you profane it. It is of the sacrifices offered to him, that is, the bread of the Eucharist and likewise the cup of the Eucharist. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Tertullian wrote in 210 AD, There is not a soul that can at all procure salvation, except it believe whilst it's in the flesh. So true is it that the flesh is the very condition on which salvation hinges. And since the soul is, in consequence of its salvation, chosen to the service of God, it is the flesh which actually renders it capable of such service. The flesh, indeed, is washed in is washed in order that the soul may be cleansed. Hmm, the flesh is washed so the soul may be cleansed. Hmm. The flesh is shadowed with the imposition of hands that the soul may be illuminated by the spirit. Hmm. Laying on of hands with the soul being illuminated by the spirit. It's connected. Hmm. Weird. The flesh feeds on the body and blood of Christ that the soul likewise may be filled with God. The Resurrection of the Dead, chapter 8, A.D. 210. Weird. The flesh feeds on the body and blood of Christ. Hmm. Weird. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Hippolytus wrote in 217 A.D. on a commentary on Proverbs. He's talking Proverbs 9, chapter 9, verse 2 here. And she, wisdom, has furnished her table, refers to Christ's honored and undefiled body and blood, which day by day are administered and offered sacrificially at the spiritual divine table as a memorial of that first and ever memorable table of the spiritual divine supper. Hmm. Christ's honored and undefiled body and blood are day by day administered and offered sacrificially at the spiritual divine table. Hmm. Weird. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The huh. So, uh, the Council of Nicaea, uh, Canon 1, in 325 AD. It has come to the knowledge of the Holy and Great Synod that 
in some districts and cities that the deacons administer the Eucharist. So we're talking about deacons administering the Eucharist to the presbyters. Whereas neither canon nor custom permits that they who have no right to offer should give the body of Christ to them that do offer it. Canon 18. Look at that. Uh, deacons are administering the Eucharist. They have no right to offer the body of Christ to the presbyters. Hmm. Weird. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Cyril of Jerusalem, Bishop of Jerusalem, not Rome, wrote in 350 AD, before Augustine had even converted, the bread and the wine of the Eucharist, before the holy invocation of the adorable Trinity, were simple bread and wine. But the invocation having been made, the bread becomes the body of Christ, and the wine the blood of Christ. Catechetical Lectures, 197, AD 350. He then continues, Do not, therefore, regard the bread and wine as simply that, for they are, according to the Master's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. Even though the senses suggest to you otherwise, let faith make you firm. Do not judge in this matter by taste, but be fully assured by the faith, not doubting that you have been deemed worthy of the body and blood of Christ. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Ambrose of Milan, the mystery, 390 AD, only three years after Augustine's conversion and before Augustine was writing. He says, perhaps you may be saying, I see something else. How can you assure me that I am receiving the body of Christ? It, remains, it but remains for us to prove it. And how many are the examples we might use? Christ is in that sacrament because it is the body of Christ. The Mysteries, Chapter 9, 390 A.D. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The Theodore of Mopsuestia, Catechetical Homilies, 405 A.D., the same year that Augustine wrote about the Eucharist, but thousands of miles away. When Christ gave the bread, he did not say, this is the symbol of my body, but this is my body. In the same way, when he gave the cup of his blood, he did not say, This is the symbol of my blood, but this is my blood. For he wanted us to look upon the Eucharistic elements after the reception of grace and the coming of the Holy Spirit, not according to their nature, but receive them as they are, the body and blood of our Lord. We ought not regard the elements merely as bread and cup, but as the body and blood of the Lord, into which they were transformed by the descent of the Holy Spirit. Catechetical Homilies, chapter 5, verse 1, A.D., 405 A.D. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The and now I'll, I'll end with where I started, apostolic succession, a doctrine that Protestants completely reject, unless you're an Anglican, and supposedly wasn't developed until after Augustine. Let's see what Clement wrote about it in 95 A.D., while the Apostle John was still alive. The Apostles have preached the gospel to us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has done so from God. Christ, therefore, was sent forth by God, and the Apostles by Christ. Both these appointments, then, were made in an orderly way according to the will of God. Having, therefore, received their orders, and being fully assured by the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and established in the word of God, with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. And thus preaching through the countries and cities, they appointed the first fruits of their labor, having first proved them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons of those who should afterwards believe. Nor was this any new thing, since indeed many ages before it was written concerning bishops and deacons. For thus saith the scripture in a certain place, I will appoint their bishops in righteousness and their deacons in faith. Weird. So Clement of Rome writes in 95 AD that uh, the apostles went out and appointed the first fruits of their labor as bishops and deacons. Hmm. Strange. And uh, Clement of Rome then continues, Our Lord Jesus Christ, and there that there would be strife on account of the office of the bishop, 
For this reason, therefore, inasmuch as they had obtained a perfect foreknowledge of this, they appointed those ministers already mentioned, and afterwards gave instruction that when they should fall asleep, other approved men should succeed them in their ministry. Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The if the Catholic Church was created in the late 4th century by St. Augustine, as Dr. Brown says, why is there so much explicitly Catholic teachings well before Augustine? We see apostolic succession explicitly taught in the 1st century. In the 2nd century, we see clear mentions about the Catholic Church being run by bishops and being the institution of God, and the Eucharist being the body and blood of Jesus. But most importantly, if the early church was actually Protestant and the Catholic Church came along later, where are the writings of people arguing against these new innovations? Where are the proto-Protestants arguing against Catholic innovations? Where are they? Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement. The I mean, when Islam, Mormonism, and Protestantism, Protestantism all came along, we found earlier existing groups of Christians arguing against them. Where are the proto-Protestants arguing against these newly created Catholic teachings? Where are these proto-Protestants telling Clement that he's wrong about apostolic succession, that all we need is a book? Where are the proto-Protestants telling Justin Martyr that the Eucharist is neither the body and blood of Jesus and certainly is not a sacrifice? Where are the proto-Protestants telling Irenaeus that the Eucharist isn't really the body and blood of Jesus? Where are the proto-Protestants telling Irenaeus in the second century that the Bishop of Rome was not in fact established by Peter and Paul and we don't need to accept bishops? We can clearly find explicit teaching, beef, Catholic teaching, before Augustine. How do you explain that? And how do you explain the absence of the Protestants arguing against these teachings? Show them to me. Where are they? Surely someone would say, you changed it. Surely you'd have some type of protest movement.